Well, December is definitely proving to be milder than I ever would have expected. It's the middle of December right now and it's like plus 12 out. There's people all over the place doing a little bit of work getting their decks ready for winter, I guess. Now, I've pretty much done all the service work that I need to do on my Skidoo, so I'm gonna load that into the trailer today. And I don't know if you noticed, but the DR's got that rooster sound of the starter. So today I wanna to take that starter apart and grease it and make sure that all the journals inside are in good shape. So first, I've gotta load my Skidoo, and then we're gonna get onto the DR. I've got quite a few projects for the winter that I wanna do, and I hope you'll stick around to see those become accomplished. So sit back, grab yourself something warm to drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. That guy's really doing a lot of work today. I guess I better get busy too. Now anybody who's owned a DR for any length of time is most likely familiar with the sound that the starter makes when it starts to dry out. Now Suzuki is notorious for being cheap with the amount of grease that they put in things like their suspension, their starters, all kinds of things, their headset bearings. Um, and what happens is, is that lubricant sort of dries out those bronze bushings that are in there start to squeal and they can get really, really bad over time. Now, I've already done this once about a year and a half ago, but I noticed it's starting to make a little bit of squealing noise anyway. So I thought, let's take it out. It's fall. We'll get it fixed up and I can show you how it comes out and how to fix the problem. Okay, let's get started. Okay, I need to take this tank off and I need to take the exhaust off to really get the starter out easily. So to start, I'm gonna drain all the fuel out of this tank. It's not necessary to do that, but it's the end of the season for me and I want to take this fuel and I'll probably put it into my truck. That way next year I start with fresh fuel. Okay, let's get to work. I'll put a little hose extension on there and we'll drain it out. Okay, I'm just gonna pop off some fuel lines here this safari tank actually has two petcocks and they're joined sort of right in this t-connector here so i'm going to use a little bit of clear vinyl fuel line basically and i'm going to drain it into this two gallon tank the safari tank holds over 30 liters and uh it, it i think i have about almost two gallons of fuel in here now as the fuel tank drains i'm going to take the side panels off i'm going to use my JIS screwdriver here to pull out these fasteners. They come out really easy. The side panels just slide off and you need to do this on both sides to get the seat off.
Now once the side panels are off, there's two bolts, one on either side. You use a 12 millimeter socket to pull these out and they come out relatively easy. And of course, once these fasteners are out, it's just a matter of wiggling the seat off. Now, my storage box makes this a little bit more difficult, but basically you push down on the front of the seat and up on the back of the seat, and it comes off this little tab right here on the tank. Now, on the fuel petcock on the Safari tank, there's actually two positions. There's on and off and reserve, so there's three. I'm going to turn this off. Now, on the standard tank, there's on, there's uh, prime, and then there's reserve. Now, because this is a vacuum petcock, so vacuum is drawn through this small little port here, fuel comes out here. When the engines shut off, you actually put it either in reserve or the on position to stop fuel flow, not in the prime. So anybody who's watched my show before knows that I've made that mistake. I'm just going to pop the fuel lines now off the petcocks using this nifty little hose removal tool and then I'm going to drain any fuel that will come out of these hoses into just a small mason jar just to collect it all and I'm going to reach through to the back side and flip on the other petcock here just to help it drain that same thing here I'm just going to use these little tools and pry this off And I'm going to try to catch any loose fuel that might still be in the fuel line. And it seems to be coming out of the petcock too. Oh, right, I turned the petcock on. So I'm going to actually turn this one off just to catch any small amounts of residual fuel in the tank. Next, I'm going to use a 10 millimeter socket to pull out these two bolts that hold the tank down. This is the same mounting areas that they have for the standard tank. Now the Safari tank also has a cross brace underneath the tank right here. It runs right across to both sides of the saddle basically. It has a small 10 millimeter headed bolt here that has to come out and that will allow you to free the tank itself up and then pull the tank off. You can see here it's loose now. Now you just lift up on the back of the tank and slide it off. And I'm going to set it back right here next to the standard 13 liter tank that comes on the DR650. Now for comparison, you can really see the difference between these two tanks. It's almost comical. The 13 liter tank is almost one third of the 30 liter tank that you can get from Safari. It really is interesting. Now, Always remember to take these little rubber donuts off so you don't lose them. I'm just going to take them off and set them in the parts tray here. And I think we're ready to keep moving. Now, the starter is located right down in here. This is the starter. To get the starter out, we need to remove this oil line, the chain tensioner, and the exhaust itself but before we do any of that we need to disconnect the battery so when we undo this terminal it doesn't have a live wire going to the starter okay let's start by taking the battery off to get the battery out we're first going to take off this hold down bracket that sits on here so i'm going to use a 10 millimeter socket it pulls off relatively easily now underneath here is your positive terminal and over here is your negative terminal. I'm just going to fold this back and I'm going to remove the positive terminal right now. And then finally the, the neutral as well. I just pull this wiring harness back and your battery slides out. The DR uses I think a 135 cranking amp, cold cranking amp battery. I'm going to turn my attention down here to the exhaust. I'm going to blow out all the dirt and contaminants that there might be around the exhaust before I actually pull it out. It's a good idea so you don't get any contamination within the exhaust ports. Now I'm going to wiggle a six millimeter Allen key head down into these sockets and just turn these by hand. Now, last time I had this off, I put a good coat of anti-seize in the holes as per the manual. And as you can see, 
these bolts come out quite easily, these cap head bolts. Then the retaining ring basically just slides down the header pipe. I also have to take off this cover. It's held in place with I think four millimeter Allen keys here, three or four millimeter, I can't quite remember. But basically you just break these free. They have to be fairly tight or these are notorious for vibrating out. Then the cover comes off and behind this bolt is this bolt, which actually holds the exhaust pieces together. Little Allen key fits in there and you just have to loosen this. You don't have to actually take the bolt out, but there is a long amount of threads on this that you can back out for the slip fit. And it's just a matter of sort of wiggling and eventually you'll be able to pull the exhaust header tube right off. And if you look inside, you can actually see one of the exhaust valves from this angle right here. It's kind of interesting. Now I'm going to take off these two banjo bolts that hold the oil pipe on. Now I need a 17 and a 12 millimeter. So basically I just break these free, top and bottom. And you need to be able to move this hard pipe out of the way to get the starter out. When you do actually take these banjo bolts out, you'll find there is a compression washer above and below the banjo fitting. So make sure that you capture those. You can see it right here. I'm going to put both of these together and I'm going to do the same on the top. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to thread these right back into their oil ports for a couple reasons. One is so I don't lose them but also it'll help keep any contamination out of the oil system that might get knocked in there if you're not careful. Now we just fold the oil pipe out of the way. I'm going to now look at removing the chain tensioner off of the bike. So I'm going to get my little Allen key here and I'm going to break the Allen bolts free. It's easy enough to do. They're not in there too tight. Once I remove these cap head bolts, the tensioner just comes out on its own. Sometimes you have to give it a little, ha a little hit with a soft face hammer, but here you can see what the tensioner looks like. And you can also see what good condition my gasket is in. Lastly, I'm going to take the positive electrical connection off the top of the starter itself. Now, there is two nuts here, one on the top and one underneath the actual fitting. Now the one underneath the actual fitting holds that stud in place and you can't get a regular 10 millimeter wrench on there. So I have a set of super thin wrenches here that are used for specific purposes like this. Sometimes you, they call these cone wrenches if you're working on bicycles. I'm gonna need the 10 millimeter. So what I do is I slide that underneath and this allows me to hold that stud post while I undo the nut off the top. Failure to do this can and will often lead to you twisting the stud and actually ripping the wires off inside of the starter itself. I've done this a couple times myself. So once you get the nut off, you just basically lift off the lug and I'm just going to put the nut back in place for safekeeping. And finally, we get to the two bolts that hold the starter in. Now they also hold this bracket for the clutch lever, uh, the cable itself. So as you take these two bolts out, and I think they're held in place with an eight millimeter socket, you'll see that this um, bracket comes free. You just tuck it out of the way and finally just lift up and wiggle the starter. It's held in place basically now with just a large O-ring on the shaft end and it comes right out. You can see both the starter here and uh, we'll put it up onto the bench. Now, there's a small drain hole in the valley where the starter sits. I like to poke that free with a screwdriver and then just come in with a little bit of brake cleaner and clean the valley up. If you don't do this, eventually that, that small hole will plug and you'll get water settling in there, especially if you do any river fording or anything like that. Okay, let's take a look at the starter a little closer. Okay, now that we've got it on the bench here, let's have a look. I'm just going to clean up the end of it here a little bit so we get some of the oil off. So basically, 
What happens with these things is there is a journal that fits or sits underneath this cap here that tends to dry out. And over time, the starter will start to squeal. Now at the other end, the end of this shaft fits in a bearing inside the engine itself, actually near the starter gear that engages this spline shaft. So it's well supported on a roller bearing on this end. What we're going to do is we're going to take these two long uh, bolts out and pull gently pull this cap off and lubricate that journal with a little bit of grease. So it's pretty simple. I'm just going to use a nut driver here and take these off. And these are both the same length so you do not not need to worry about mixing them up. I have a little bit of anti-seize on these from the last time I had this apart. You can kind of see right here is a pair of alignment marks. You want to make sure that the cap goes back on with those two alignment marks. Right now I'm just going to wiggle the cap off and you'll see there's like a rubber gasket there. And this will just pull off like so. Now here we can see our brushes. We can see our rotor in here. And the brushes are held in place with these small springs. We don't need to worry about any of this. As long as the brushes are in good shape, these seem to be, we really want to lubricate this shaft. That shaft fits down inside this bushing right here. I'm just going to clean this up. You can see there's a little bit of um, probably carbon off of the brushes themselves. I'm going to clean that up and then we're just going to add a little bit of grease into that journal bearing right there. So just give me a minute and I'll get that done. All right, that looks much, much cleaner in there. I'm just going to use a small paintbrush and apply just a little bit of full synthetic grease down inside that pocket. It doesn't have to be a tremendous amount. It'll just be enough to lubricate that journal. And then it's just a matter of putting the pieces back together. So I'm going to remember this witness mark here. We're going to line that up with the witness mark here. There's a corresponding one on the other side here. I do always put a little bit of anti-seize on the threads when I do take something apart. Like I say, this already has quite a bit left on it. I'm not going to add any additional anti-seas at this time. Once you snug it down, if you stand it on end like this, the positive stud sits on top and Mitsuba, at least if it's a factory starter, should be facing up. See these cutouts right here? These actually fit around inside the engine itself and allow it to slide in. I have in the past installed things upside down before. It will go in. You'll never get it into the bike if you do it that way. So it's just another double check when you're done to make sure that this, the wording is actually facing upwards, the studs on top, and these ears have the cutaways on the bottom like that. Okay, let's go put this in the bike. The starter basically just sits back in the way it came out. But just, you can see the way those ears now fit around the, the cases of the engine. If you had this in backwards, it would never fit in the way it is here. Reinstallation's basically the same, only in reverse. So once you set the starter onto the gears, you're going to come back in and fasten that bracket with the clutch cable back onto the starter itself and that secures it into the frame of the bike or the crankcase of the bike itself. Next I'm going to reconnect the positive lead for the starter 
and I'm going to use that slim wrench again just to hold the stud so it doesn't turn as I tighten up the nut itself. Now as a little bit of a safety measure or protection I guess I use a battery corrosion preventer spray. I use this on both the battery and I'm going to use it here on this terminal. I just give it a couple spritzes then I'll put the protective rubber boot back on and I'll follow this up just with a, a rag to clean up any overspray. Okay, next we need to put the chain tensioner back into the engine. The way it sits here, it will not go back in. Now, this is an automatic chain tensioner, so how this works is this plunger here is spring-loaded. As the chain stretches, it continually pushes out and pushes out and pushes out, and then it basically locks in place. This cannot physically be pushed back in from this side. If you tried to put it in right now, you would end up just damaging either the chain adjuster or you would put so much force on the cam chain that it would be brutal or you may even snap these tabs off or more than likely strip out the bolts themselves. So we need to retract this plunger and it's really really easy to do. So I've cleaned this up already. I've come in and just wiped it down and got all the excess oil and, and uh, grease or anything that's on there. Now on this end there is a small 10 millimeter headed bolt. I'm just going to break that free and you can take this off. So it just comes out like that and what you'll see, or it's a little hard to see, there is a gasket on the end of that to make this oil tight. Now, hopefully we can see this. I'll see if I can get a little bit extra light on there. Let's see. This actually has a, a hole that runs down all the way into a flat headed screwdriver um, screw head, I guess. You need to have a small precision screwdriver. To do this, I'm going to use this steel chainsaw carburetor adjustment screwdriver, and it just fits in until you feel it click into the head. Now, if you watch, I can turn this in and it retracts that plunger. Now, if I let go of the screwdriver right now, it will automatically extend. What you need to do is screw this all the way in or twist it clockwise all the way in until it locks and then you just give it a little snug down and it will actually stay like that. Once you get it into the bike you just insert the screwdriver and you back it off and it will release the plunger and it will push up against the chain guide inside. You put back on the, the uh, cover screw there and we're ready to go. My gasket looks brand new, so I'm going to reuse it. They're $3 at your Suzuki dealer, so if yours is at all in question, just change it. I, you can use RTV silicone, some people do, but really for the price of the gasket, I believe a gasket's better than just putting in silicone. It's your choice, but really, it, it's really inexpensive. So let's get this back into the bike. I'll insert the cam chain tensioner into the hole here. And then I'll insert the two cap head screws and thread these down to the face by hand. I'll follow this up with an Allen key and I'll snug these down reasonably tight. I don't have a torque rating for these. If it does leak a little bit, you can always come back later and just snug these down a little bit more. I'll follow this up by releasing the spring pressure with my small screwdriver and then finally inserting the cover bolt here that seals up the cam chain tensioner. Now again, you don't have to over tighten this, you just need to seal it. And I'll just snug this down here. After this, I'm going to turn my attention to the oil pipelines. Now remember, there are two compression washers that fit on either side of both banjo fittings. I'll insert the lower one first, but leave it loose so that I can still sort of manipulate the 
upper oil line. And it's exactly the same. It has two compression, compression washers. Now the upper bolt gets tightened down to 23 newton meters and the lower bolt here is 20 newton meters. So I'll snug these down by hand and then I'll follow them up with a torque wrench to make sure that they're torqued well. I should probably replace the uh, washers but I've had really good luck with these resealing. Next I'll put the exhaust back on. So I'm gonna wiggle it through the frame here and slide it onto that slip joint. And then I'm gonna sort of manipulate it around the front of the frame and into the exhaust port itself. Now, the exhaust donut inside there looks really good. I don't have any concerns over that. I'll slide the keeper washer up. And I'll make sure to add a generous amount of anti-seize to both bolts. Now, next time I get this exhaust off, I'm gonna change those bolts, not because the threads are in bad condition, but the actual cap head Allen, Allen key head is, is getting a little bit corroded from all the heat cycles. So I'll snug these down uniformly going back and forth. Then I'll come in with a wrench, snug them down a little bit more, and then ultimately I'll, I'll torque these to 19 foot pounds and they're ready to go. I'll come in after and put a little bit of anti-seize on the bolt here and then snug the slip joint bolt down. I don't have a torque rating for this. I just tighten it until it feels good. It doesn't have to be super, super tight. And finally, I'll cover it up with the, with the plate here. Snug these down. You may want to use a little bit of blue Loctite if you're worried about this vibrating. And we're good to go. Well, that about wraps up today's project on taking this starter out, greasing the end cap, and getting it back into the DR. Normally, I would be now putting the battery back in, put the tank on, and put the seat back on, and the bike would be ready to ride. But as I said in the beginning, I have a few other projects that I want to work on over the winter months, and I don't want to keep taking the tank on and off, and the seat on and off, and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to leave the bike the way it is. For you, I hope that your riding season's still continuing. I hope that you're getting out there hitting some trails and maybe putting some miles on before old man winter catches up to you. Now this project isn't really all that hard. I hope I was able to show that to you. And honestly, there's some people out there that can do this without even taking off the exhaust and the oil lines. They somehow manage to get in there and, and get the end cap off with the starter mostly still in the bike. I like the way that I did it because I actually get to take the exhaust off, which means those head bolts, the ones that hold the exhaust into the head, actually have to come out. I can clean those up, put some more anti-seize on them, and get them back in there so that the bolt never seizes in the head. So until next time, I'm Dino. I really hope you stop by soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. I had a lot more tools to clean up. It's amazing how many get used when you do a project like this. I'll see you soon.